back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. All right, welcome back to the PFC podcast. Today I have Doug and today we're going to talk about how to get the most out of Emma. Hey Doug. Hey Dennis. What I wanted to, I guess, start this off with is just watching other other medics um, using the Emma. They really don't know. They know they're supposed to put on the end title CO2, the ET tube. They know that the number is supposed to be between 35 and 45. But beyond that, you know, that's about all they got. Um, let's start this off with what exactly does end title CO2, like what are we monitoring? Right, um, so end tidal CO2 is monitoring the percent of carbon dioxide in blood that has been returned um, to the lungs, right? And when that CO2, uh, when that CO2 diffuses into the lungs, it then travels through the alveoli and the small airways and up through the, you know, the main trachea uh, and is measured either um, at the bottom of the endotracheal tube, uh, depending on the mechanism, uh, or at the top of the endotracheal tube if the patient is intubated. And there are also side, side scanning monitors that actually can be affixed to non-invasive oxygen delivery systems like nasal cannula and simple face masks. Okay. Uh, so that's what it's monitoring. What, what should we be using this for other than just confirming that the tube is in place? or uh, monitoring for ROSC during CPR? Well, like I said, the main uh, utility of this comes from the operating room where anesthesiologists use it to monitor both the placement of the endotracheal tube, the continuous placement of the endotracheal tube, and um, a continuous measure of ventilation during surgery. Uh, those are the big three things that you can, that you can use it for. Uh, it, and in field medicine, you know, ensuring that your endotracheal tube is in the correct position, um, that's probably its highest utility, and that it stays in that position during transport, which is, you know, really high risk for dislodgement of anything, IVs, endotracheal tubes, traction splints, etc. Um, ensuring that that endotracheal tube stays in in position, and the nice thing about having a continuous visual monitor uh, is that you know you can look over at it any moment and get a you know thumbs up, thumbs down answer about whether uh, your tube is in the right position or not. Um, the other thing then it, that's you know designed to do and does very successfully is help you guide the ventilations of. Uh, the, the ventilation status of the patient, i.e., how much carbon dioxide they're blowing off. You know, if it's rising up above 45, you can increase your tidal volume or your respirations, your minute ventilation, um, to help them blow off more CO2. Um, if it's falling too low, in general, that's because the patient is spontaneously hyperventilating. Although it may be that your patient is sedated and your 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 vent respirations are turned up too high and you're overventilating the patient either way um, you can adjust that if it's if it's on you you can do it with the ventilator if it's on the patient it's really hard to make a, a, a tachypnic patient breathe less fast short of really really snowing them with um, sedatives and sometimes even paralyzing them which which we do in the ICU I don't definitely don't recommend that so um, so helping you dial that in the biggest thing that it's useful for in trauma as far as, as, far as monitoring is in TBI patients, patients with severe TBI, um, ensuring that their carbon dioxide is kind of in a sweet spot. Um, too high and um, the vessels of the brain will dilate and allow more blood into the brain, uh, into the cranium, so thus increasing the risk of intracranial pressure rising. Um, too low, like below, uh, uh, thir you know, 30 millimeters of mercury, the, um, uh, the, the, or when it, when it falls rather below 
say 38, 35 millimeters of mercury, it causes vasoconstriction, which can actually be used therapeutically as a last resort to reduce blood volume going to the brain and, and reduce the space that the blood in the brain takes and kind of buy you some space in a brain that's swelling. Um, but too low and, and, and so many blood vessels will um, constrict that you run the risk of a hypoxic injury because you're not getting enough blood to the brain. So initially you want to start out in kind of the good range uh, of PCO2 with a brain injury patient and monitor that carefully because too high or too low um, you know, can put that, that patient at risk of injury. It, it, it's really almost essential for monitoring a, a patient with a severe TBI. Now, I know that there's a difference between measuring from end tidal CO2 and measuring from, say, an arterial line or even a venous line. And in a healthy patient, they, they should correlate somewhere between two to five millimeters of mercury. The vessels, um, the blood is always going to be on the higher end. And in some talks about resuscitation, they're talking about using end tidal CO2 to actually monitor your patient. Um, is that is that a possibility? Yeah, so, you know, carbon dioxide gets to the lungs in blood and, um, and, and blood gets to the lungs based on the volume of blood that's in the intervascular space in the cardiac output that kind of pumps the blood around the pipes of the vascular system. So the thought is that if there's any serious deficit in either cardiac output or blood volume, that it would affect the amount of carbon dioxide that gets back to the lungs um, and measuring um, end tidal CO2 could help diagnose, um, you know, shock states based on low cardiac output or low blood volume, as well as the response to resuscitation for those shock states. It's been pretty well shown in shock due to cardiac arrest, so cardio, you know, the, the abs, absolute heart failure, um, that a rise in end tidal CO2 um, correlates with a return of spontaneous cardiac activity, therefore spontaneous cardiac output, and a return of spontaneous circulation. And the nice thing about monitoring end tidal CO2 during CPR for this reason is you don't really have to stop and take a pulse um, because if you have a good waveform with your, you'll get a, if you have, if you're doing good CPR, you'll get a decent waveform on uh, if you have kepnography, um, which is um, w which is end tidal CO2, but with a waveform with each um, each breath, um, or in CPR with each chest compression. Um, if you don't, uh, you'll just have the um, kepnometry, which is the number itself, will be low. It might be five. It might be ten. It might be fifteen. But when, when spontaneous heart activity, normal heart, organized heart activity returns, you know, it'll bump up to 25 or above. Mm -hmm. um, and just looking at that, waiting for that to happen, um, can allow the rescuers to keep doing CPR until they see the number bump up and then pause and check a pulse and the pulse is probably going to be back. Okay. Um. So other than just reading the numbers, like what, what do I need to be monitoring? What do I need to be looking for when it comes to using my end tidal CO2 in the field in a trauma patient? In the field in a trauma patient? Um, well, the main thing would be um, if you're going to put an airway in your trauma patient. Am I assuming that? Yes. So absolutely the most useful thing uh, is confirmation that your airway is in the right place. And um, either kepnometry, which is the number, or kepnography, which is the number and the waveform, are the most sensitive indications uh, that the endotracheal tube is in the right place. You can get false, um, false, I don't know if it's a false negative or a false positive, but you can get lung sounds with 
esophageal placement mm -hmm. or what sound like lung sounds. Uh, you can see the tube fogging within esophageal placement. Um, basically, you can get a lot of, you know, tens of percents uh, of esophageally placed uh, endotracheal tubes have signs that they're actually in the trachea. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but you will not get a good end tidal CO2 number. You know, it'll be zero or five or something like that. Um, in the hospital, we use uh, paper um, capnography uh, or capnometry, I'm sorry, where it's just basically litmus paper um, mm -hmm. and, you know, litmus paper is sensitive to acid base and carbon dioxide is an acid. So um, if carbon dioxide blows over the litmus paper, it changes from yellow to, to purple. Um, that's our, that's, that's what we use. But the, the digital uh, or waveform readouts are much more accurate. So that's, that's thing number one. And then number two is it'll confirm and it'll give you something handy to look at as you transport that patient to make sure that tube stays in place because there's super high risk of, and of coming out and all of those exams that we do listening for lung sounds etc get even harder when we're on transport modalities to the part of, to the point of being basically impossible you know in a, in a rotary wing or a fixed wing airframe it's you know oh we think the endotracheal tube is out well listen to his lung sounds well good luck with that right so, um, one correction I want to make earlier, I think I talked about um, end tidal CO2 measuring the um, percent saturation of carbon dioxide. That's not correct. It's the, it's the partial pressure of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So just like a, um, arterial blood gas will measure the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood, end tidal CO2 is measuring the partial pressure of, of, of CO2 in the air. Right. And that number, just like anything else is in context with the what's happening with the body so things like is if the patient is becoming uh, hypothermic and tidal co2 will start to come down because metabolism starts to slow down um, you're not putting off as much co2 you know that whole process anything can be affected and you have to kind of take everything into context yeah, the, the carbon dioxide dissociation is a lot more linear than the oxygen dissociation, but it's also affected by oxygen dissociation, right? So um, there's, so I guess it's kind of tricky, not kind of tricky, but um, so the oxygen dissociation curve is, is absolutely affected by temperature mm -hmm. and acid-base status, et cetera. Um, and if oxygen doesn't get knocked off red blood cells, then carbon dioxide isn't going to come on. Once it comes on, you know, so you're right. So oxygen dissociation affects the loading of carbon dioxide into red blood cells. Um, once it comes on, there's not a lot that affects its dissociation in the lungs. That's relatively mm -hmm. linear. So what gets delivered in the cells is going to get delivered to the lungs. There's not a lot that happens along the way that will shift it. How should we be incorporating this? into our normal flow, our normal monitoring, our normal trending uh, when we're treating our patients? I think the, the evidence is there. Um, the best practice of monitoring and tidal CO2 is really for airway placement and ensuring stability of the airway in, in the trachea, number, number one. Number two is in the severely brain injured patients, it's very useful for monitoring because small fluctuations and, and lots of things can um, affect the outcome in severe TBI, right? You know, one episode of hypoglycemia, one episode of hypovolemia, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, not very long of hypox hypoxia. Um, can really affect outcomes in a brain injured patient. So, you know, if I say God is in the details for managing all critically injured and, and ill patients, God is really in the details for managing the brain injured patients. So you really want to avoid one bad episode. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you can do a lot without digital monitoring of critically ill patients. You can do a lot with your exam. You can do a lot with your GCS urine output, your vital signs, pulse oximeter, etc. cetera. Um, a antidal CO2, a lactate is not going to add much mm -hmm. to the management of those patients. Um, 
where end tidal CO2 adds a safety net um, to your patients as if they're intubated uh, and where it adds a lot to the monitoring that can affect the outcomes of patients as if they have a severe TBI or suspected severe TBI. Beyond that, as far as, as um, helping assess, um, you know, whether they're in hypovolemic shock and um, if they are, uh, how they respond to resuscitation, I think the jury's really out. The, there's, there's only one study that I could find when I did a literature review for this podcast um, that looked at um, end tidal CO2 as a marker of volume resuscitation, and it was in this, it was in sepsis patients who were hypovolemic, and um, and what they did was at you know hour zero they got an end tidal CO2 and then two other pretty well validated markers of of um, um, sepsis severity lab markers of sepsis severity right the the um, uh, mixed venous oxygen saturation. Um, which we wouldn't normally get, but it's basically the oxygen that comes back to the heart at the end of the venous cycle. Of the ven- it's almost the, the heart's equivalent of CO2, right? CO2 goes to the lungs and whatever oxygen's left over, you measure in the heart. And, the, and, then, and then lactate, which we all know is, is you know, a decent measure of, of um, anaerobic metabolism and, and um, uh, tissue hypoxia. So uh, at hour zero, they all correlated pretty well. Um, so perhaps it could be used as an indicator that your patient is in shock. Um, and uh, But at hour three after resuscitation and an hour six after resuscitation, it did not correlate at all with a response to volume resuscitation as the others did. You know, So okay. the patients that responded to volume resuscitation, their lactates went down, their, their uh, mixed venous oxygen saturations went up. Those are both an appropriate response. And the SCVO2, some went up, some went down, and it didn't correlate in a statistically significant way with these two well-validated markers. So I don't think you can use it. Um, I think I don't, I don't think this, sh- this shows, in fact, that you c- it's, this one study shows that you can't really rely on it, that your patient is responding to resuscitation. Perhaps you can use it to show you that your patient does need resuscitation. And there, wa- there are one or two trauma studies where end tidal CO2 was looked at pre-hospital and pre-hospital and lower values did correlate with patients that were in more severe shock. Mm-hmm. But they weren't, they didn't use it to, um, they used it more for prognosis. Okay. These people are in worse shock. They may do work, you know, less well. Um, their outcomes might not be as good. They didn't, they didn't use it to trend with resuscitation. So I really think, you know, this kind of segues into a discussion that a lot of people have, and, and we're working on the damage control resuscitation clinical practice guideline right now. And, and one of the big sections in it is, you know, monitoring, right? And, and a big part of monitoring and damage control resuscitation and trauma is, you know, as we give these patients resuscitation, how do we know that they're doing well? Um, how do we know that they need more? How do we know that maybe they're not responding appropriately and we should think about, um, you know, not pouring any more resources into them if we have to make that hard decision? And the, the category that all of these measurements and indicators fall under something called markers of resuscitation. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you can Google markers of resuscitation and trauma in sepsis, and you're going to get hundreds, if not thousands of papers and references. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, it's a little bit of a, a fraught topic because what I don't like about that that term is the tendency of some people to want a marker of resuscitation Mm -hmm. and make decisions based on a number or a indicator. Um, They want the the magic bullet. Right, exactly right. You know, and some for some people it's lactate, for some people it's mean arterial pressure, for some people it's respiration rate, for some people it's urine output. 
And the best that I've ever heard it was in a presentation I found recently from a trauma fellow. I can't remember um, at what university. And he said, um, you know, on one slide he said, you want markers of resuscitation? And on the next slide he said, guess what? There are none. Because, and, and his point was that it's really a composite of multiple pieces of data. Most importantly is the actual you know, examination and appearance of the patient, him or herself, that tell you whether they're responding or not. So, you know, markers of resuscitation is really a composite, not a number. Um, now, that much said, there are, if you were going to look at labs or objective numbers that correlate with response to resuscitation, you're, you'd be better off looking at lactate uh, of the things that we are talking about in the prolonged field care community um, that may they either are available to us on something um, like an iStat or we hope will become available to us on something like a portable lactate monitor, um, like a finger stick monitor. Um, you'd be better off, much better off looking at, at lactate than you would be looking at end-time CO2. So they both are important, but for different reasons. End-tidal CO2 is, much a, is a much you know, more valuable tool for monitoring airway placement and um, carbon dioxide and its effects on the brain in a severely brain injured patient. Lactate is a much more uh, valuable uh, lab or objective data for m m measuring um, the severity of, of, um, of shock in response to resuscitation. Right. Sorry, that was a really long That's answer. That's <laughs> right. Because I think what I really liked about what you said there is no one thing like even if they came out and said everybody has lactate monitors you still have to pay attention to your patient you can't just continually stick them with this thing and it's going to tell you everything you need to know right. and title co2 the emma great piece of gear <laughs> it has its limitations but even if it did correlate perfectly with shock you still have to pay attention to your patient. There is no magic bullet. Um, stop looking at it. You need to continually do, uh, go through your vital signs, monitor your vital signs, trending your vital signs, and take in the complete picture of what's happening to your patient. Uh, somebody very experienced at it, like yourself, Doug, could you do a resuscitation without entitled CO2? Um, maybe without invasive monitors, absolutely, because you have the experience to actually look at your patient and get an impression of what's happening inside. Um, somebody with less experience, maybe who isn't paying attention as much, they can use this entitled CO2 to tell you, okay, your patient's breathing, um, your tube is still in place. Okay, the number is between 35 and 45. Ventilation-wise, he's okay. Um, but that doesn't give you an excuse to not monitor your patient. Just because one piece of equipment is telling you good things, that doesn't mean that your patient is doing good. Well, will you, you agree with that? Absolutely. You, you know, there are two things I think about what you just said. Um, you know, number one is, the hard thing about complicated patients is they're complicated and, and and complicated things generally require a more complicated approach or a more complex approach and um, and that's just that's just the way it is you know if you want to be in the business whether you ask for it or you know um, that was the deal you were dealt that day when you know the, the, the bird couldn't fly or uh, mm -hmm. or the fixed wing or the the casavac couldn't come get you um, you know monitoring, you know, treating and monitoring complicated illnesses and complicated injuries requires um, taking a bunch of complex, or taking a bunch of information to kind of form a composite picture as best you can. Now, the more data that you have, the more granular that picture will be, mm -hmm. and I think the better decision that you will make. Um, and it, it, at a minimum, you know, you should be able to have all of the vital signs, a good mental status exam, 
uh, urine output and skin appearance, you know, pupillary exam for your brain injured mm -hmm. patient. That's, that should all be there. If you add an end tidal CO2 monitor, that's good data. It's another data point. It can tell you some things. If you add a lactate monitor, but you can do it without those two things. Um, but what you have to do is synthesize the whole. Um, and the trend is absolutely, you know, important. You know, if your lactate monitor is getting worse, but your peripheral pulses are coming back and your mentation is good, I would question the lactate monitor probably right. that more than I would your clinical exam. Right. Um, but, you know, don't read the lactate monitor and say, oh, I'm going to stop resuscitation because the lactate has gone from, you know, his lactate's gone from six to ten. Um, and, and then the other thing I would say is that even as an experienced resuscitator, that I would have an entitled CO2 monitor in every transport patient because it gives me a visual to look at when my ears might be out of the picture for mm -hmm. listening to lungs and even ventilator alarms. You know, having a visual number and waveform that I can look at is great. It's why I tell guys, you know, hey, if you're in the back of the truck running a prolonged field care case or exercise, um, keep that pulse oximeter on and keep and keep looking at it. It's going to give you two pieces of data. It'll give you a heart rate so you know you still got a pulse. You also know he's got a pulse that's good enough to pursue his finger, so you can infer some blood pressure data from that because if his systolic blood pressure is too low, you're going to be getting really erratic readings or no reading at all, mm -hmm. and you're going to be getting pulse ox. I mean, there's three really robust pieces of data that you can get in the back of an ATV or a truck and never have to, like, stop, take a break, and listen to your patient. Right. Um, and, then, uh, and then with a brain-injured patient, even in the hospital, uh, I'm going to be monitoring a tidal CO2 in a severe TBI patient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's one of the great big, the big tenets of prolonged field care in the prolonged field care working group is it's never just one piece of data. It's taking everything into context and having a mental picture of what's happening with your patient. Um, someday another piece of equipment is going to come along and it's going to have some kind of index and it's validated by whatever, you're still going to have to reach out and grab his pulse. You're still going to have to find out, does the skin feel warm or not? Um, does he still have urine output? Is he still breathing? You're mm -hmm. still going to actually have to physically touch somebody. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, all this equipment that we are adding to our patient is actually putting more distance between ourselves and our patients. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll never forget the time that I was uh, in fellowship at shock trauma in Baltimore and, you know, the respiratory, we had a patient who was intubated and with, as with all intubated patients, every morning the respiratory therapist will do um, something called a spontaneous breathing trial. They'll turn the ventilator onto settings where it supports the patient, but the patient is breathing on their own. And then they take a bunch of numbers from that um, and kind of arrive at a score that says, you know, this patient's, you know, ready to be extubated or not ready to be extubated. And they brought us the numbers uh, on this patient and said, yeah, look at his, this is his score, and it looks like he's ready to be extubated. And my attending physician said, um, well, let's go in the room and see how he looks, right? And he said, look at that patient to me. Uh, um, and I did, and, you know, he was definitely not comfortable, mm. right? His respirations weren't all that high, but they were very disorganized. His chest was rising when his belly was falling, and then his belly would rise and his chest would fall, which, which is called... Um, Either thoraco abdominal dissociation mm -hmm. I learned right there uh, and it's a sign of accessory muscle use mm -hmm. in a patient that's on a ventilator um, and he was you know didn't really respond when we called his name and he sort of squeezed our hand but then he didn't and he said this guy might meet extubation criteria by numbers but he does not meet extubation criteria by exam and if we took that tube out we'd be putting it into him in somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I really learned the value of, um, you know, laying eyes on your patient um, to help b because this that assessment of do I feel good about this or not uh, is actually something that's not that hard to learn. And I think a lot of 18 deltas and special operations medics 
you know, have that skill, right? You know, you're on patrol in a neighborhood and you have that spidey sense of, you know, something's right or not right um, just because of something being out of place. You know, apply it to your patient. And if your sense is that something's not right, it probably isn't. If your sense is that the patient looks pretty good, it probably is. And, and that's, that's an important thing to add to the data. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a real good place to, to end off. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.